the River Humber and the last remaining keel to sail these waters. Her name's Comrade. She's 66 years old now. Sailing windward on this bright day. She could be back in the 20s and 30s, when keels such as her played an important part in keeping trade and industry running. The winds are no longer harnessed to fill the sails of these hard-working vessels that carried their cargoes with such grace. Engines replaced the sails and the masts came down like trees. And then lorries and their thundering loads all but took over by the early 70s and the keels were finished. Comrade should have gone too, like the rest of her kind. But now she sails again. by the Humber Keel and Sloop Preservation Society. And with her mast and basic square rig back in place, she heads downstream from Ghoul Docks. A tiny reminder of days gone by. A fire burns again in her cabin, and by it sits Fred Schofield, the man who sailed the comrade most of his life. I was born into a Keel family and that my ancestors had been keelmen for at least three generations before me. And I thought nothing about it. It was just a way of life to me. I was quite happy with things until I found out that I uh, middle-aged, they were start as one was calling them a curiosity of shipping. The society was founded in 1970 by an engineer called Cedric Lodge, who came up to Hull and saw the need to do something to preserve the sailing ships that used to trade on the river. Cedric Lodge sought me out. And I wasn't ready for retiring then. I wasn't at retiring age. In the first few years, we concentrated on collecting photographs, collecting memories, talking to people who'd sailed and owned the ships and uh, making a collection of sailing gear, hoping that one day we might find a ship to put it on. And I carried on as long as I could. I got some of the retired keelmen and sloopmen to work with me when I wanted any help. A lot of the time I was on my own. When there was no work, I was on my own, which quite suited me. I didn't have anybody to pay. Fred was pretty well known on the river. Uh, he'd been in the trade all his life. And um, his ship was quite well known too. We lost gas coal, all the gas coal trade, because uh, the oil had been found in the North Sea, you see. It meant virtually closing down altogether. And it come to those only three cargoes left. Uh, she'd always been well looked after. He was a highly respected man. And his ship had almost been one owner from new and uh, been well cared for. And she was one of the ships we would have been keenest at that time to buy. I suggested then to the Moe Society, if they wanted her, they'd better buy it as a going concern. And I would stop and work her on thirds, the old way, which we used to do, until these three deep cargoes had been carried. So they agreed to that. So they bought the ship, they bought the business, you see. He made £150 for the Society. And the bit they've got, that paid me off, you see. 
In a way, when we bought the ship, Fred came with it. And uh, he's been our guiding light ever since. He supervised the restoration of the ship, the re-rigging, and in fact, when he unrigged his keel, he kept two notebooks filled with dimensions and details of rig and cordage, just in case they should ever be needed. And using those, he was able to restore Comrade to her original sailing configuration, and then teach us how to sail her. And uh, he was our sailing master for five or six years. He taught Colin Streeton, the present sailing master. Uh, and he was a pretty exacting teacher. He had high standards. And he was a hard taskmaster because uh, although we were all, all mature people, he sort of treated as a teenage mate would have been. People fell by the wayside, but I decided that it was worth the bottle to take the crumbs from the table and eventually get the whole cake. So that's what we did. Well, Colin, Colin is an actor. He knew how to angle a spritzel. He knew how to angle a fore and aft rig, you see. But he had no idea what to do with a square rig till I started showing him. And he learned the hard way. We went out one day, and I let go of the tack before I told him to. And the tack, the tack angle come back and clouted him. He'd not do that again. That's the way they do learn. Working on keels has always been dangerous. It was also a hard way of life. In their heyday, there were hundreds of these keels working the inland waterways network around the Humber. From York, down to Lincoln, Wakefield, Sheffield and Leeds. These were the ships that never went to sea. But what cargoes they carried? Dried fruit from India, hides from Africa, flour, linseed oil, cotton and coal. It may have been hard, but it was also a romantic and slow way of life. The speed limit on the canals was three miles an hour. When they couldn't sail any further, they spilled the wind from their sails and were pulled by horse or steam tug. The basic square canvas sail on a mast is an ancient way of harnessing the wind. The Vikings used it on their longboats, and it survived into the 20th century on these keels. But Fred saw technology take it away. I sailed as long as I had any canvas left and I threw it away. But it wasn't worth bothering with. Diesel oil was fought and cigar in them days. And that was a long time since. I should say I was about 1936 when I put the first engine in. I thought, well, it's a pity all this is going to be lost because everybody will put in engines in at that time. Eventually, it was all going to disappear. And I kept my gear thinking as one day, if I made enough money, one day when I got retired, I might eventually rig a keel out. That one day came, but Fred had to wait 40 years to see the Comrade under sail again. In 1974, the Society bought her for around £1,200 and began the restoration. To do this, they needed Fred's notebooks and knowledge and a 56-foot length of Norway spruce. I think the biggest job really was the spars, the mast and spars. Fortunate there was a, a quite a clever carpenter and um, he led a team, uh, made the mast and the spars. In the meantime, we'd got enough money together for sails and they had to be fetched up from Roxham when they were ready. And we spread them out on Westwood to check that they were all right. See, then, I'd, uh, then I, the yards were bad and everything, I bent them on. And we kept quiet about it. And once you were ready for a sail, there was only me and him still knew how to sail, huh? Fred was a little bit nervous, obviously, because he was, he was a, he would have said a crew of farmers aboard, and he was the only person who knew what was going to happen. But he just told us what to do, and I, I fully anticipated he would start the engine, would, would motor down river to some quiet place, and then try out this rig. And I never thought you could sail this shaped hull with this sort of rig, I would have said it was impossible. While we're in Ola, but I owe the man's look, we actually sailed it out of the harbour without the engine, just enough wind to give a steerage way. And we sailed down river until we got to Immingham, and uh, 
met the flood tide down the bottom end of the river and turned and the wind had gone east, it was summer and the wind had got a sea breeze, the wind had gone easterly and they turned her back up river to come back up to Hull and we set the topsail and it was the first time a keel had been under sail on that river since the latter part of the war and uh, he was very pleased indeed as we all were. Comrade made a lot, meant a lot to Fred and the, and the society um, in, in that sense had achieved one of the sorts of things that I, I think he wished to achieve in the late 30s or early 40s. If we bear in mind that um, the sailors who took the stone up the River Ouse to build Selby Abbey or York Minster were using the same techniques as Fred and other captains used to sail their keels and that those techniques were used for centuries and have only been replaced in our own time by totally different techniques involving power, pushing buttons and scanning radar screens. Uh, the changes have been so dramatic and so recent and I think also that the keels have played a tremendous part in the social history of this region. They weren't just a means of moving cargoes about, but they were a way of life and they were a home for the families which operated them. Uh, so many families lived on board. Many people here in Hull and Humberside were born on board the keels. And that's another reason why I think those memories should be preserved. Say so I was carried aboard at three weeks old. The first brother was born, actually born aboard in a, on a keel in Alexandra Dock at all. I would be three years old then. The family increased when the, my mother was expecting my eldest sister. She went ashore. That would be the time that I would go ashore as well. And I would start school, going to school then. Fred lived at Stainford, in a house on the canal bank. When he was 13 and a half years old, his father sent Fred to come on board as mate. Around the same time, another youngster went to work as ship's mate. Her name was Evelyn Patrick. They all, all call me matey, all of them. Even the lighter men at Hull, they always call me matey, yeah. And my dad was telling me, he says, Arthur, George has stopped with me three years, Arthur stopped with me three years, Elsie's stopped with me a year, how long are you stopping with me? I said, well, Dad, you've worked for me 14 years, so I'll work for you 14 years. But I stayed 18 years with him. And all those 18 years, I was more of a captain than I was a, a mate. Because <laughs> I used to stop at the weekends while he came home. My dad used to come home at weekends. And I used to look after the boat for him while we were there, you see. Evelyn's memories are of a happy childhood working with her father. She can remember some delightful stories of life on board their keel. We're all going to Kidby and my mother and my dad says, oh, he says, she says, what can we do about the bird and, and Jip? So he says, well, bring him on board. Jip was a beautiful dog. He's a, he's a retriever and he was a chocolate coloured. And you, you didn't have to say much to him. He, he was human, nearly. So we took the canary and, uh, and we took Jib. And we were going sailing down the canal. Then all of a sudden, Mother gave such a yell. Oh, she says, he's got out of his cage. He's got out of his cage. And he flew up the hatchway. And he went right across the canal and flew into the long grass. So Dad says, Jip, fetch him back, fetch him. And Jip jumped straight into the water and swam on the river bank and he brought that bird, he got hold of that little bird and he never hurt it. And he swam back and my dad lifted him out of the water and the bird was as fresh. It just got a little bit wet, that's all. When, he put, when we put him back in the cage, he whistled and sang like I don't know what, because he was back again. <laughs> he was whistling at the top of his voice. Evelyn Holt, or Evelyn Patrick as she was born, was a very remarkable person. 
she still lives at Thornwater Side, which is the ancient port of Thorn that was used before the canal was built. And they traded up the Dutch River, the old tidal river up to Thorn. Uh, there wasn't even a towing path up there. And there were times when uh, the wind was adverse, uh, when Evelyn would tow her father's keel, fully laden, up that river. Uh, it was hard, but it was possible. Many people did it. It was really hard work for a girl when I was young, because I went from 14. And one time we were sailing, we were coming up the River Don, up this River Don here. And uh, my dad said, well, he says, it's nearly high water. He says, do you think you'd be able to go and pull us? He says, and, and let us see how, if we can get a bit further. He says, because I don't want to stop here. There's too many stone heaps. So I says, yes. So he took me in the cob boat and took me in my line and, and uh, uh, around me, you see. And I put it on and I was pulling away. And as I passed one of the farms, the farm man and his wife were stood there watching me. And he just shouted out, Hey, lass, this is that better fetch the old grey mare out its shed and bring her for this poor lass and tether her. Tether her up to it and let her pull board. <laughs> of course, I was laughing when he said that. <laughs> well, she must have liked it, though. She wouldn't have stuck it. She wouldn't be compelled to do it. I'm sure of that. But she'd like me. She'd be brought up aboard. It's difficult to look back into their way of life. A lot of their lives would be enjoyable. It was a much slower way of life. Um, they didn't have or didn't need the possessions that everybody seems to require these days. Um, in the summer, obviously, most of the town, very pleasant way of life. My wife was a swimmer. We often used to jump overboard and leave them out to it. We'd have a plant towing us down on us for get hold of if you're going too fast. And we got coming down Bonnie Hill or Thorn Moss, somewhere like that, where it was clean. Plenty of fresh water, we'd jump overboard and have a swim for two or three miles behind the ship while the mate was steering. In the winter, it would be a totally different story. We were out sailing one Sunday when we'd first restored Conrad, and it was a particularly good day, nice topsail breeze, little scudding clouds, the sun was out. And I remarked about what a way to earn your living. And he said, this wasn't the way you earned your living. Earning your living was when you were taking 120 ton of coal to Grimsby the first week in January. And it was, of course, it was different. The man in the next key said, surely you're not going to take that lass out of this bad weather. He says, uh, uh, blowing a gale. Oh, he says, it'll be a fair wind. When we once get across to New Holland, he says, it'll be a, nearly a fair wind, he says, and we shall be all right. But once when we got out on the Humber and we went straight across to New Holland, my dad had to tie me to the chimney because it was that rough we were, we were rolling that much. Evelyn still has a painting of uh, her father's keel, painted by Reuben Chapel, the ghoul artist. Uh, many keels were painted by Reuben Chapel around 1900. It was rather a dull day when Reuben Chapel painted that picture and uh, Evelyn's made the sunshine. This is a model of Comrade as she was when she was first rigged in 1929 by the Schofield family. It shows the Sheff Sheffield size keel, Sheffield size keel meaning that she was of uh, specific dimensions to trade through the locks to Sheffield. The accommodation for the mate would be under the foredeck here beneath that hatch. From this end of the hatch to the after end of the hatch covers the cargo space in a keel. And Conrad would carry 120 tonnes of coal, or any other cargo that would weigh 120 tonnes. <coughs> From the after head ledge there to the stern post is the skipper's cabin, and it's entered down that companion way there. Conrad's cabin is panelled out in uh, pitch pan panelling. She's tiller steered. The objects hung on the side of the vessel are lee boards, and these, when the keel was, had no cargo in, she would, the working keel would only draw just over two feet of water. So consequently, if the wind was on the beam, they would slide across the water. 
They call lee boards because it's always the lee side board that's down and the vessel would be pressed against it by the pressure of the wind and convert lateral motion into forward motion. Comrade is a big heavy vessel to work. Her gear is heavy uh, because it's old fashioned gear. With a crew of people that are involved in um, a very physical activity like sailing Conway, you've got to be able to rely on the other members of the crew as they rely on each other and rely on me. Stand by! A gear is so heavy that if one person doesn't do the job he's supposed to do at the right time, and timing is essential for working a ship of this size, people can um, have limbs broken, and it's happened on Comrade, or in the utter extremity, they could be killed. Rise, you tuck! It's um, a very unforgiving river. It doesn't let you make many mistakes before it wraps your knuckles. You've got to be constantly aware of where you are, what you're doing, and particularly what the river's doing. Because uh, big tides, spring tides, you've got a lot of flow there, and you, you, whereas you can be sailing on quite happily, the river is carrying you into danger at up to three, four miles an hour. In a sailing vessel, you're having to wander about all, the, all over the river to make use of the wind. So consequently, you've got to know what's underneath the ship as much as what's around it, particularly underneath the ship. How much water you've got, what state of the tide it is, whether the, you're running into shore water or whether you're running into safe deep water. Be aware of it all the time. The answer to it all is knowledge and keep yourself up to date. Common sense and be aware of your environment and don't get complacent with the humber. I've become so involved now, it's taken over a large part of my life, but it's worth it because not only is the vessel being preserved and preserved well, but all the skills are being preserved. She's not just in a stationary museum, she's taken out and sailed regularly. It's a feeling of being involved in preserving the past without working in a museum. It's real, it's a living, breathing piece of British maritime history. I'm very pleased he's been, been used in that way. Because there's no use, there's no trade for kids to do whatever. Whether well, they're rigging or no rigging. And I'm very happy to see her doing that and showing people how things used to be done. And giving them the pleasure. I'm very much afraid that after this present generation's finished, we have a job to find anybody else to say, look, take it on. That's my man, you really, now. As you become expert and work together, it tends to knit you closer together. And uh, not only the common interest, but being able to rely on the rest of the club. If I couldn't rely on them, and they couldn't rely on me, then you would drift apart. And so it's through uh, mutual interest and mutual skills, it joins you together, and the friendships develop. Comrades. to sail a ship you would put up a pole in the middle and put a large square piece of canvas on the pole and uh, that's the technique which the Vikings used and the medieval seamen who traded around the North Sea and the English Channel and uh, the skill of handling that very basic fundamental rig is a very ancient one and Fred's the last of the Vikings 